Oh, you're always so incompetent with women. Oh, yes. Today's way above average for me. Congratulations. Good night. I was having a discussion about John Schlesinger's Marathon Man with an old friend, and I remarked that I'd always enjoyed the first half of the film, but that I found the second half rather sad. My friend was stunned and said, what's wrong with you? The second half contains all the action, all the teeth drilling and the chase through New York in the dead of night and Zell's trip to the Diamond District. The genius of William Goldman's script becomes readily apparent at times like this. It occurred to me that in some ways, Marathon Man was really two films in one, and which half you liked best, if you could separate it out that way, roughly cutting it in half, could actually reveal a lot about how a person thinks. If you look at the first half, it's basically Babe Levy, Dustin Hoffman, coming into his own, creating a life worth having. He is clearly a gifted historian who will undoubtedly write a brilliant PhD thesis. He has Dr. Biesenthal, Fritz Weaver, in his corner, who seems to believe in Babe. That's actually quite rare. And Babe has an older brother, Doc Levy, Roy Scheider, who truly loves him and feels free to drop in on him unannounced, but who's enough of a mensch to realize he can't arrive empty-handed. A decent bottle of wine to Doc is more like a necessity than a luxury. Plus we know, though Babe does not, that Doc is actually Scylla, the ultimate secret agent who can take on and defeat all comers. Despite every possible advantage, the assassin Chen, James Wing Wu, still can't manage to kill Doc, nor can a bomb that goes off incredibly close to his waiting cab. Also, Babe has a cool European girlfriend, Elsa Opel, played by Marta Keller, who seems to really appreciate his quirky American sense of humor. At this point, there's a lot of exposition about Christian Zell, Laurence Olivier, but it's not entirely clear what his connection to the brothers will be. By the time that Doc, Elsa, and Babe go out for lunch at the French restaurant, everything seems pretty good. I have to stop here. At this point, Babe's life is worth having. He has school friends, a new professor and mentor to guide his work, and then there's Elsa. Enough said. What could be better? It strikes me that I enjoyed the first half of the film because I desperately sought connection with other people. I wanted respect from others. A PhD once meant that. I wanted an interesting job. I wanted to have a wife and children. You'll need a mate for that. I wanted a brother who cared about how I lived, who would bring cool gifts and want to have a drink with me, and take my girlfriend and me out to lunch, and who wanted to really know who I was, and who would always be there to look out for me. I was seeking all those kinds of connections, and seeking a life worth living as I saw it. The other things in the first half of the film, the bomb, the soccer ball, the opera. It's a French opera. A very long French opera. Chen forever watching and waiting, and everything else was just fascinating, but not really related to Babe at all, so just curiosities of one type or another. But then Doc does something unusual, and shows that he knows Ilsa isn't what she appears to be, and that she may actually be working for Zell. It's not clear. It is clear that she is lying, and thus seeing Babe with an ulterior motive. This is where the film starts to get interesting for someone like my friend, though watching Doc expose Elsa for not being who she professes to be is equal parts fascinating and nauseating and painful. He establishes that she is from Verbier, then makes up a few facts about the town and asks if they are correct. She says yes. I've made all this up. There is no Mountain Rosa in Verbier, and there is no Claude Lassure. You're not Swiss, what are you? Suddenly, Babe doesn't seem so cool since he's been deceived from the start. Then, inexplicably, after she's been exposed, he starts arguing with Doc, not Elsa. Wait, let her go. Why? Because she's a phony. She's after something. Can't you see it? Why don't you stay out of it? Which makes it clearer still that he doesn't really understand the impact of what Doc has done. Babe needs to believe that she's real, but the viewers know that she isn't. She never loved Babe. He was just an assignment. Then things really start to go bad. Doc is murdered by Zell. So now there's no one to protect Babe, and Babe doesn't know whether to trust Peter Janeway, William Devane. Zell's two henchmen, Carl, Richard Bright, and Earhart, Mark Lawrence, invade Babe's apartment, abduct him, help keep Babe from struggling while Zell tortures him, and then participate in what looks to Babe like a rescue, though in truth it is an entirely staged event, for the purpose of making Babe believe Janeway is a protector like Doc, so Babe will open up to him. Everything's pretty much over now. Babe's brother's gone, his romantic relationship was a fiction, his academic career, well, it's set back more than a little since it's hard to think he'll go back to class after all this. Babe now has to work things out for himself with no protector, and does so. After outrunning the two henchmen, 
Babe escapes and later ends up shooting Peter Janeway. Babe is suddenly a murderer and induces Christian Zell to kind of murder himself with the wrist knife as he trips and falls down the stairs in the water pumping station after Babe throws his precious attaché case filled with diamonds into the water. Babe's life, as he knew it, is effectively over. Now what did this tell me about my friend? He was way less Disneyland about life. He's not particularly romantic about relationships. They're kind of more like normal relationships to him. He just seeks a friend in the woman, someone to trust, where I always somehow wanted more like a soulmate. Spoiler alert, this is really hard, hard to find, whereas my friend's expectations were much more likely to occur. Also, my friend was much more independent-minded about life. He was used to doing everything for himself and was one of the tougher people emotionally whom I've encountered. Nothing kept him down, and he didn't seek the knowledge of professional mentors as I did. Finding out about such people later on is always a disappointment. Many times, they are not who they profess to be. My friend saw Babe making Zell swallow his diamonds as a fitting revenge. We agreed on that at least, but taking on such a man as Zell with only a pistol seems crazy and foolhardy. My friend likes to see adventure and risk and seeing people doing extraordinary things in film and life. He saw Zell as a criminal to be punished in whatever way Babe saw fit, whereas I was mostly scared for Babe. For God's sake, Janeway remarked to Babe that Zell ran the experimental camp, Block 10, the medical experimentation block at Auschwitz. Conversely, I hope to see Babe get a tenure-track position at Columbia, take over for Professor Biesenthal when he retires, and hopefully live long enough to collect a pension. In other words, we tend to watch a film with the same eye as we see the world. I avoid confrontation and seek to cooperate with my colleagues. My friend, on the other hand, does his work brilliantly and won't listen to others. He knows he's right, and he invariably is. So the two halves of the same film. If you like the first part, you're kind of an idealist and are interested in traditional, sometimes superficial sorts of success. Jobs, approval, dissertations, money, hot foreign girlfriends, and people taking care of you. Whereas, if the second half of the film is more to your taste, you're probably more pragmatic, realistic, and independent. You don't mind seeing everything torn apart and blown up, because you probably perceived it as cursory bullshit in any event. The difference between the first half and the second half of the film is essentially the difference between idealists and realists. Elsa Opel is a pleasant dream of what life could be. But in the end, you're going to have to deal with Zell. Is it safe? Look, I tell you, I can't do it. Thanks so much for watching. Please consider becoming a supporter of the Obsessed with Cinema channel. The donation links are found in the description below. I would like to thank those individuals who regularly contribute generously to this channel. Rai J. Brad W. Richard G. and Mark R. I am truly fortunate to have such loyal viewers. As always, I hope you will return to watch other videos. Come on, why don't you say you'll see me? Huh? Alright. I see you again. But it won't come to anything.